Why is the habit of comparison such a dangerous thing? Because at the root of it, you're looking for meaning. You're looking for purpose. You want to know you're beautiful. You want to know you're enough. You want to know you measure up. And if I have more than you, that must mean I'm better than you, I'm smarter than you, and maybe I have validation. If I could just start this business, maybe my father was wrong, and what he said about me wasn't true. If I could just have a marriage that's good and kids, maybe what my mother said about me and critiqued me about wouldn't be true. If I could just, if I could just, if I could just... And comparison is the habit of constantly looking and searching out words to, val- to, to validate myself, to prove that I'm worth it, to prove that I have a purpose, to prove I have a calling, I'm worth something. 1 Samuel 18, starting in verse 6, says this. It says, when the men were returning home after David had killed the Philistines, The women came out from all the towns of Israel to meet King Saul with singing and dancing, with joyful songs and with trembles and leers. As they danced, they sang. Saul, oh, that's really kind of like hard to read with my white jacket, eh? No, we're good. Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. And Saul was very angry. This refrain displeased him greatly. Then they, credit, or they credited David with ten thousands, he thought. We'll come back to that word, he thought, later in the message. But me only thousands. What more can he get but the kingdom? Little bit dramatic, right? Like, like calm down, Saul. It's one song, but apparently he's going to steal everything you own now. Uh, and verse 9, and from that time, From that time on, Saul kept a close eye on David. And the next day, an evil spirit from God came forcefully on Saul, and he was prophesying in his house while David was playing the harp as he usually did. And Saul had a spear in his hand, and he hurled it, saying to himself, I'll pin David to the wall. But David eluded him, and that's one of my favorite words in this passage, twice. (laughs) David apparently was a slow learner. After the first spear, he stuck around uh, for the second. I'm not sure why, but it's just an interesting aspect of the Bible. Why don't we pray today? Jesus, we thank you. God, we thank you for your word that is more than a historical account. God, we believe it's active. We believe that as we stand and we look to your word and we read it, that the power of God through the Holy Spirit is here and it speaks to us and it changes us and it shapes us. So Father, as we sit underneath your word this morning, we pray that you would correct, that you would convict, that you would encourage, that you would bring life where there is death. In Jesus' name, amen. Last week we started a series called a Freedom Series. Coming out of Easter, we celebrate the death and resurrection of Jesus. And Pastor Craig, last week, if you missed it, Uh, you'll really want to go back and watch it because for the next eight weeks, we'll be kind of springboarding off of that. Uh, But we looked at this idea that, yes, Jesus came to die. We had this old way of living. We were dead in our sin. Christ made a way for us to be reconciled back to God despite our sin. His death paid for our past life of sin. His resurrection afforded you and I a new life. And in this new life, there's now new possibilities. And we looked at the idea of communion. How communion, Jesus takes what was historically in Jewish tradition, four cups, and he brings them all together in one. We looked at the cup of sanctification, which is that moment of salvation. The cup of deliverance, it said, this refers back to Egypt, that God got Israel out of Egypt, but it took a little bit of time to get Egypt out of Israel. How many of you know that you were once saved? When you got saved, you weren't perfect from that point on that there's still aspects of this old nature and this old life that are prevalent that God needs to deliver out of us. There's then redemption, not just getting the old life out of us, but reminding us that there is a plan and a purpose. According to Ephesians 2.10, there are things that God has for you, purposes, plans, the part of the body, your function, that we are called to lean into and actually discover and walk in, and that ends in the cup of praise. We walk through that. But we start, most of us, we start at that first cup that Pastor Craig talked about, this of salvation. 
and we're free and we're grateful and we're thankful. Some of you, maybe in this room, you've recently given your life to Jesus and you're like, man, this couldn't get any better. This is incredible. I used to struggle with doubt or shame or whatever it was sin, but I'm free. I feel alive. This is unbelievable. But sooner along the line, sooner along, sooner rather than later, you'll end up bumping up against something. Where you never used to struggle, you know, you come to Jesus or you repent, you have that moment and, and you're not struggling, but all of a sudden that, that same temptation comes back up again. You're like, oh, I was saved, it's fantastic, this is so great, but then all of a sudden that anger issue comes back up again. And we try a little bit to get free, but then we do one of two things that are really unhelpful. We either relegate that area of freedom, we hear about freedom on the stage, but we come up with this idea and we read like, oh, maybe it's, that's a one day thing. Like, no one's perfect, so I guess this is just kind of like my cross to bear. Saul had his thorn in the flesh, and this is mine, so I, I guess I'm just going to struggle with this area of, of bondage in my life, and God loves me, and it's good, but I'm just going to kind of struggle, and there's forgiveness, right? So I'm just going like, to kind of keep asking for God for forgiveness, and one day in heaven, I'll be free from this. We either put off freedom that Christ bought and paid for and intends you to walk in today, we put off until heaven, or you resign that this is just me. Maybe this is just how I am. Maybe I just struggle with anxiety. Maybe I'm just a fearful person. Maybe I just, this is my addiction. I have a propensity towards this sin, and, and that's just me. This is just how it's going to be. But we see in Jesus, friends, a completely different third option. And I think it's important to say if, if you're looking for reading, uh, a great book to read along with this series would be uh, Renovation of the Heart by Dallas Willard. I remember reading this book, and it was a couple years ago now, and, and reading through it, and it hit me with this passage where this author, this, this theologian that followed Jesus at the end of his life, he's writing this, and he actually had the belief, as he studied Scripture and what it said, that complete freedom from the things that hold us bound is possible this side of heaven. That we are called to be shaped into the image of Christ. That we can walk sinless. And even saying that, I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. No one's sinless but God and this. And I, I'm saying the habitual sins. The constant things that you're going through. Someone needs to hear it today. It is possible through Christ Jesus and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit and your participation through spiritual formation, to walk free. Not one day in heaven, in this life, you can walk free. You don't have to continue to struggle with whatever it is you struggle with. There is freedom in Jesus. And far too often as a church, we walk far below the freedom that God has called us to. Far too often, I relegate and I resign in myself that I'm just going to be an impatient person. I'm just going to be a lustful person. I'm just going to be that addict. I'm just going to be the whatever it is. We resign that this is just me. Can I say that Jesus died for so much more than that family? And throughout this series, we're going to begin to look at some of these common things that keep us bound, and to look to Christ Jesus and say, would you free us from these areas? Because the reality is, if you don't look like Jesus right now, you're not done. Amen? You're not done. Oh, uh, yeah, I, I get it, Daniel, like just little, little tweaks here and there. I'm pretty good. You know, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't get drunk anymore. I only have one wife. Uh, you know, I, I don't steal. I don't lie, and I'm pretty sure she likes me half the time, so i got to be doing something right. Um, you know, Dan, Dan I'll do, I'm doing pretty good. I, I know, okay, there's always a little bit more we can do. No, no, no. Can I say that if you don't look like Christ in your character, in your thought life, in how you engage with the mission of the kingdom of God, in the power and the authority that he walked in, God's not done. And you're called to walk in that. And over the next 18, or 18 weeks, goodness, that would be a long series. <laughs> over the next eight weeks, we're going to look at the topics of disp uh, depression, addiction, anger, failure, worry, rejection. Common things that all of us, if we read through that list, we kind of relegate to, I guess that's something I'm just going to struggle with. I guess that's something, and, and you might not have everyone on the list. You may. 
But the reality is all of us would struggle with something. But this morning I want to talk about something that I believe is like the sneaky one. Like if I were to have a conversation with you, most of you would probably say like, yeah, it's probably unwise or unhelpful, but you wouldn't see it as dangerous. Maybe you wouldn't see it as sinful even. It's just, ah, it's just part of kind of who we are and how, and I, I'm not sure how that would stop me from this, and, but I believe this is the springboard or the garden box to which all of those things we mentioned ahead of time that we'll be talking about can grow out of. And I think the plan of the enemy in his sneakiness and his craftiness would be to blind us from the power and the damage of what we're about to talk about today. Today we're going to look at the habit of comparison. The habit of comparison. And some of you right away will be like, oh, I don't, I mean, comparison's not a sin. Like, what, what it actually, there, there's good things. Aren't we supposed to be like Christ? That's a comparison, Daniel. And, and comparison in and of itself isn't necessarily positive or negative. Webster's Dictionary says it's a consideration or an estimate of the similarities or dissimilarities between two things or people. This can be helpful at times. Healthy comparison, considering an expensive purchase. You want to take two different things and you compare the pluses and the minuses. You look at reviews and you're comparing it. Deciding what food to eat. Your wives are comparing constantly all of the possible options on the face of the planet of what you want to eat for dinner. It's always going through all of the different options. We compare that burger to this burger, that steak to this steak, or that gluten-free bread to cardboard. Whatever it is, we, we can... <laughs> Just teasing. Kian actually had some really good gluten-free bread. I, I can't repent. I apologize. Complex decision-making. It's actually wisdom sometimes to pros and cons and look at it and compare and weigh your options. When we're trying to learn something, don't we compare ourselves to the teacher? If you're learning a guitar, you're comparing yourself to someone else, how do I, what do I need to do with the idea of learning and acquiring that skill? I follow people on Instagram for hunting or fishing to learn how to fish like them or hunt like them so that my freezer is more full than it is empty. I go to a marriage weekend to look at teaching and we evaluate our marriage and it's kind of a how are we doing versus the standard. There's a healthy comparison. And we're actually called to compare ourselves to Christ. The Bible says he's the cornerstone, or for those who understand construction, the plumb line. I think sometimes you, you start building and framing, and things can appear to be square until you hang that plumb line, and you see, oh, what appeared. I, we don't compare ourselves to other people. We don't compare ourselves to what culture says, because it might be leaning the wrong way, but Christ is what we're called to be shaped in. So we compare ourselves to him. However, if we're honest... That's not the comparison most of us struggle with. If I'm honest, I'd be like, oh, no, comparison's a good thing. And I'm just trying to get myself out of admitting the struggle that I have. Finding an excuse to get out of the comparison that is not helpful, but it's incredibly harmful. Psychologists call this social comparison. And it's interesting that the, with the rise of social media, there's more and more studies and psychologists and a, a, a studying this idea of comparison that comes with social media. Social comparison is this idea that I compare myself to people who are either above me or below me in my mind. And it's this causes this sense of I'm less than them or I'm better than them. We will either compare up and it makes us feel inferior, insecure, jealous, or envious. With a social media influencer, that guy, that workout guy, or that guy that has that business that 10 x it. And I'm like, I, don't, I think I minus x it. I'm not even sure what's going on with my business. Or, or that marriage is this, or we see people's highlight reels. I remember when we had our first child, I about threw Katie's phone out the window. Because it was like, oh, well, what about this bottle and this bottle? But this person says it's this, and this person says this. And you're comparing constantly to the mom guilt and the parent guilt of how we're doing this. And if I don't swaddle them right, they're never going to get a job. And I swaddle them too tight, they're going to be as smart as I am. And that's terrible. So, like, what are we going to do? I'm going to mess up our child. We just need to stop. But the social comparison of looking up, and it constantly gives us a sense that I'm not good enough. I'm not beautiful enough. I don't have his, her body or, or, or his money or his car or their marriage or their vacation. And all of a sudden, we start to compare. We compare down at times. Some of you, when I'm like, hey, 
You're not like Jesus. If you're not like Jesus yet, he's not done. You're like, yeah, I know, but at least I'm not like Pastor Daniel. Right? If we want to feel bad, we can pair up. If I want to feel good, I can pair down. I'm, st- I'm the fastest runner in my neighborhood when the kids are out. There isn't a single child. Well, maybe Benton, actually. Uh, <laughs> that used to be a true statement. I am so much faster than Zoe and Wyatt when it comes to a foot race. I feel so good about myself when I show them how high I can jump. I can reach tall things. If I'm feeling in the sky, I will compare myself to that. If I, if I want to feel really great, I'll compare myself to Jacob with building something. I will not compare myself to Rob. Now, if I don't know how to turn on my phone, I will have to humbly go back to Jacob and get him to help me with all my tech needs. But we can compare up or we can compare down. And some of us, when I made that statement, in your mind, you're like, yeah, I get it, but I'm, I'm not as bad as I used to be. And there's this idea that you, you want to see personal growth, and I understand with goal setting certain things, it's good to see how far you've come, but when your comparison to your old self is an excuse to, to disobey and not obey what God is calling you to, it's harmful. Because you're not called to compare yourself to who you were. You're called to compare yourself to who God is, who Christ Jesus is in his image, and who he's called you to be, according to his word. And comparison, we do it all the, po- all the time. President Theodore Roosevelt said this famous quote that comparison is the thief of joy. Some of you thought that was a Bible verse. It wasn't. It was Buddy Teddy Rosie. Um, But comparison is the thief of joy. If we compare ourselves to others, we may be left with the feeling of inferiority or superiority. And neither creates an emotionally healthy human being. If you just stop and think about your week, how often you've compared yourself. And the result that we do it all the time. If you have an iPhone, you compare yourself. If you have an Android, I'm superior and comparing myself to you, right? It's no, okay, never mind. <laughs> but we do this all the time. And the problem with comparison is it can take something perfectly good that we used to love and enjoy. And all of a sudden we despise it and it's not good enough. I remember this happened in our, our hunting stuff. We we had these kind of like kind of just really cheap backpacks that were way too heavy. So we're trying to do these mountain hikes, and I'm carrying an extra 10 pounds more than I have to. And, and then my brother bought a, a high-end backpack. And the backpack, that back, backpack, backpack? I'm not even sure how to say that word accurately. The bag that was on my back with straps on my shoulders. They used to be totally fine. All of a sudden, I'm like, this piece of junk it doesn't even work. Stupid. I need, a, I need a mystery ranch pack. What is this? This is garbage. And I was totally fine for it, but now I'm like, oh, I can't. And Jason was like, oh, man, look at this. It has all these compartments. The, the weight, I'll feel it. Can you feel it? Can you feel the weight? Can you feel it? No, I can't feel the weight. I got this, this lead weight on my back over here, this stupid backpack over here. And, and he, just, he was in love with his backpack. So you know what I did? I went and bought a better one. <laughs> And so I saved up and sold some things and, and doing this, and then for, I got a, 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 the, just a step up above his. And the next trip we're on, I kid you not, day three, he goes, I hate this pack. It doesn't even work. What's going on? The last year, completely fine. But when we compare what we have to what other people have, it is the fastest way to devalue the things that you have. Worse than that, we compare who we are to who other people are. We devalue the thing that Christ died and bought with his blood and loves dearly. You say, Daniel, is comparison really that bad? Like, come on, is it? We trend to rate sins, right? We might say, like, hey, two deadly sins, comparison, murder. You're like, I'll take comparison, please. <laughs> right? Because we compare murder to comparison. And we rate sins. It's like, uh, is it even really a sin? Like, I get it's probably unwise, and it's going to, I won't be as joyful, and maybe ruin, or cause me to struggle, or maybe cause me to be grumpy, but could I suggest that it's more than just an unwise habit that all of us do? And the Bible takes comparison very seriously, because if left undealt with, it can be incredibly damaged and becomes the birthplace for all sorts of sins. They would say, oh, I don't want that in my life at all. 
When it comes to this area of freedom, oftentimes like, oh, I don't want to be, I don't want to be addicted to this anymore, or I don't want to be anxious, or I don't want to be depressed. God, would you free me? I don't like the fruit that I'm experiencing in my life. And we try just don't be this, don't be this. And then we say, hey, let's talk about comparison over here. It might be the root issue here. But like, it's not that bad. Friends, if you ever want to follow Jesus and walk in the full transformation that he made available to us, we have to start just saying, I don't want the fruit and ignoring the root. The process of transformation, the process of spiritual formation and spiritual disciplines are meant to address the areas of your heart that you can't even see. And we trust the teaching of the word and we trust the traditions of the church for thousand generations, for, for couple thousand years, not thousand generations. But we trust, hey, there, there's people who have gone before me and in these practices and these habits have seen the character of Christ transform and formed in who they are. Ah, do I have to read my Bible every day? Come on, that's a little excessive. But this idea of comparison, it's no wonder why comparison is such a bad, a hard habit to break. Not only is it incredibly addictive, but it's hidden in this harmless shell of activity. But yet it's incredibly harmful and destructive. And I want to kind of paint this picture to, to draw the lines from root to fruit for you. Because in our old way of living before Jesus, before we walked through the cup of sanctification and salvation, we operated in a different way. And it is the habit of comparison if we continue to indulge ourselves in that, we'll plant the seed of jealousy. And now we're like, oh, comparison's bad. All right, okay, but oh, I know jealousy, that's, that's not a good look, right? That's not on fleek, as the kids used to say. No? No, anyways. <laughs> jealousy. <laughs> Don't compare me to your, anyways. <laughs> jealousy. And it's no longer uh, an act of evaluation, but that evaluation has hit somewhere in my heart and the seed of jealousy, no longer am I am different, but now I'm like, oh, I should be that, or you shouldn't, or I should have this. And then the negative feelings of jealousy weigh in. And it begins to plague us, and it begins to control how we act and how we say and what we do. And if we don't weed out the seed of jealousy... It will grow full grown and will eventually produce the fruit of covetousness. You're like, oh, hold one on. It's no longer, I think I deserve that and you don't. It's a step to covet and say, I deserve that, you don't, and I'm going to take it. And we begin to act in this way. We begin to covet things and we don't understand why we're doing this. And when you covet things, you can excuse yourself to do things like murder, things like adultery, things like steal, things like lie, things like walk in disobedience because I've convinced myself and bought the lie that not only do I want it, but I deserve it and it is my right to take it. practice of comparison plants the seed of jealousy, and if left undealt with, will produce the fruit of covetousness. I had to Google how to say that word proper, and I practiced for about half an hour, so you're welcome. <laughs> it's covet us is -ness, if you're wondering. But I want to look at this, because the, the, the passage we read in, in 1 Samuel this morning actually gives us a real clear picture of how this develops in a life. And how it developed in the life of King Saul. You see, we see in the story of Saul and David, read it this morning, and a brief, a brief background to what's going on. We picked up the story we we're reading where David had killed Goliath and things are happening there. But to see where comparison first found its way in to Saul's heart, we got to go back to when Saul was chosen. We see the nation of Israel always had uh, uh, priests, but it didn't have kings, and, and they were jealous that God was meant to be their king, but they wanted to be like other nations, comparing themselves to other nations, and they have, we want, we want that, we don't want to have to trust a God that we can, we want to idol their, our person, and so God gives them over to their desires, and, and Samuel, who's a prophet, he comes and he says, okay, we're going to find a king for you, and they find King Saul, through this situation, he's looking for sheep, God says, hey, that's the guy, he's the one, the type of king that the people want. And it says some interesting things about King Saul. It said he was more handsome than anyone else. It said that when he lined up, he stood a head taller than anyone else. 
And we see that even in the description of who he was, and we can kind of come to the conclusion that Saul's saying this, he's hearing this, came to the conclusion that because I compare and measure up better than other people, because I'm more handsome, because I'm taller and stronger, that earned me the throne. And we see that in his inauguration of being crowned king of Israel, it was because of comparison. And we say, oh, how can you know? No, comparison began to be a habit in his life. Somewhere along the line, Saul stopped looking to God to find his identity, his validation, his worth, and his purpose, and began to look to the side and started looking at how others would view him and how he compared to them for his worth. Why is the habit of comparison such a dangerous thing? Because at the root of it, you're looking for meaning. You're looking for purpose. You want to know you're beautiful. You want to know you're enough. You want to know you measure up. And if I have more than you, that must mean I'm better than you, I'm smarter than you, and maybe I have validation. If I could just start this business, maybe my father was wrong, and what he said about me wasn't true. If I could just have a marriage that's good and kids, maybe what my mother said about me and critiqued me about wouldn't be true. If I could just, if I could just, if I could just... And comparison is the habit of constantly looking and searching out words to, val to, to validate myself, to prove that I'm worth it, to prove that I have a purpose, to prove I have a calling, I'm worth something. And friends, Christ died to free you from that. Christ died that you might find your identity and your purpose in Christ and Christ alone. You've been freed from that. You don't have to measure up. He measured up. You don't have to be good enough. He was good enough. You don't have to be righteous. He was righteous. You don't have to be worth it. He was worth it. And Paul says when we say yes to Jesus, we are no longer out wandering by ourselves, searching for purpose. We are now brought in to the family and the body of Christ, and we are in his righteousness. We're, we're shaped into his image. And he speaks to us and says, you're my son. You're my daughter in whom I'm well pleased. Look no further than the feet of Jesus and his word and his promises for you, family. Comparison is not that bad. Comparison causes you to search everywhere else other than the one place you can find your purpose and your identity. And it's so subtle. I can't tell you how many times comparison sneaks in. I know I'm called of God doing this, but then I compare how someone else preaches to me. You think, this is your pastor struggle with this all the time. You go to any pastor's conference, within three questions, you're asked how big your church is. If your church is bigger, you feel better. If it's smaller, you feel less called. How stupid is that? So come to church. We get really insecure when you don't. I'm just teasing. <laughs> but we do it all the time. And you can say and believe in your head that, yes, I find it, but the practice of comparison tells you that Egypt is still alive and well in your heart. And friends, you don't have to live this way. There is freedom in Jesus where you can be solidified and confident in who Christ has made you to be. It doesn't mean we don't improve ourselves or grow, but our belonging and our identity is secure in the person of Jesus. If not, comparison becomes the metric for how we measure up in the world. That's why we have what's called the edited generation. Heaven forbid you ever post a picture that you're not looking fancy free. Heaven forbid the caption's not just right. We got it on text now so all my spelling errors can be fixed before someone says, what are you trying to say? And I can correct it. I see this in our daughter Zoe and her friend Windsor all the time. Because comparison will draw your gaze away from where it should be. They love playing at encounter nights. They're up here, and they just start running and dancing. But Windsor does this really fun thing, and Zoe does it too, where they start running in one direction, but they're like, hey, 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 how's it going? Whoa. I don't know what happened. I was looking at Katie, and I fell off the stairs. That hurt more than I thought it was going <laughs> to. Sorry, camera team. That was a spur-of-the-moment decision. 
poor one, I'll get better. But they begin to run, and all of a sudden they run into each other, and they hurt each other, and they start crying. Because they were headed in a direction, but they started looking somewhere else. Oh, where's Zoe? Where's Windsor? And all the time they're running at each other, thinking they're behind each other, and they just nail each other. Constantly comparing yourself to others rather than who God has made you to be. Social media, parenting comparison, career, marriage, house, etc. Will cause us to wander off the path that God has called us to. And when you wander from the path that God has called you, the Bible calls that disobedience. And onto the path that he's called someone else to, and you start living what someone else is. Because if they're really good at guitar, well, i got to learn guitar. Or they're good at preacher. i got a preacher. Or they're good at sales. So i got to learn sales. And all of a sudden, you find yourself not just disobedient, but disoriented. Because you're living what someone else has called you to. Paul talks about this. Not everyone's a mouthpiece. Some's their hand. If a, if a hand was up here doing this, someone's got to be the kneecap. Right? If you're called to be a kneecap and you're trying to be an eye, you're going to be a real poor eye. Right? It's not going to work. But then we get disoriented because we're doing something that maybe or chasing after something we were never designed to chase after. And in doing so, we attempt to become someone else rather than who God has made us to be. We find ourselves disjointed, dislocated. Romans 12 talks about us as a body. And part of this freedom series and part of the four cups is for you to discern and discover in community with the power of the Holy Spirit who God has called you to be and where you fit in the body. I think far too often, rather than looking up to say, God, who have you made me? We look around and say, what is someone else? And we wonder why we're not fulfilled. We wonder why we don't walk in freedom. We wonder why we don't see the power of the Holy Spirit released in and through our lives. So we're constantly trying to be something that God has never called you to be. You become what you constantly give your attention to. Where you look is where you will end up going. 2 Corinthians 10 verses 12 says it pretty blatantly this way. It says, not that we dare to classify or compare ourselves with some of those who are con uh, commending themselves. This is Paul speaking. It says, but when they measure themselves by one another and compare themselves with one another, they are without wisdom or understanding. Paul says, it's just foolish. Those, prophets, those apostles, they're called to something different than me. Why would I compare what I'm called to to what they're called to? Because if I compare the deeds that God has called me to to yours, I'm going to be a failure. I'm not called to lead worship and on the piano, but Elena is. Man, if I'm comparing myself to that, I have failed. And comparison and this habit of looking, and at the root of it, why it's dangerous is because it says, God, what you say about me isn't enough. I need to make sure other people validate me as well. If we do that long enough, we will become jealous. It gives, plants the seed of jealousy. When Saul heard the song, he had an opportunity. He was well used to comparing. He heard it, but rather than saying, hey, he had an opportunity, and, I, I, and it, it pains me sometimes to look at what Saul missed. You know what Saul missed out on? An incredible legacy with a son-in-law of unity in the kingdom and strength to what God has called. Saul missed out on celebrating the victory, understanding that David proved himself to be loyal. Imagine having someone in your army or under your command like that, but he couldn't do it. And he allowed jealousy to take root and seed in his heart. He needed that validation from other people, and when someone else got that validation, it drove him crazy. Comparison to David planted a seed of jealousy. And jealousy is a seed that can grow incredibly quickly if you're not careful. In that passage we read, it said he heard the song. And the next day he, he decided he was going to watch it. He decided he doesn't deserve that. I'm the king, not him. That's for me. It's not for him. And by the next morning, he was tormented by a spirit. Jealousy, if not weeded out of our lives, will produce the fruit of covetousness. Who are the ones we become jealous of most? And this is another reason why comparison can be so detrimental to a church. Because we don't normally get jealous of those who we don't know. It's not usually those whom we do not see as equals to us, rather those who we are equals with. Those way above us, the social media star, the celebrities or whatever, we might be a little envious of them. Or just, oh man, I wish I could be that. 
but it's our brothers and our sisters, those that we believe we're as equal to or deserve a little bit better is where jealousy takes root and brings division. In the Bible, we see this time and time and time again. Cain was jealous of Abel's sacrifice and God's approval, so he killed him. Sarah was jealous of Hagar, so she sent her out of the house. Jacob was envied, or envied Esau and stole his birthright and stole the blessing. Joseph's brothers were envious of his big dreams and jealous and compared, who are you, and sold him into slavery. That David's brother was jealous of him and visiting the battlefield and questioned his motives and questioned what was about to happen. The older brother in Luke 15 was envious of the attention and the forgiveness given and returned to the prodigal son who came home and the Pharisees in Matthew 27 it says that Pilate looked at them and saw clearly it was not due to the law it was not due to anything else other than the jealousy that they had for Jesus and his popularity which caused them not to just stay in jealousy but move to covetousness and say he needs to be stopped comparison is not a neutral thing friends if left unattended to if left just to be there, it will plant the seed of jealousy. And the seed of jealousy is so damaging because it puts a wedge between those we're supposed to be in unity with. It puts a wedge between, like, oh, they led worship better than me, or their small group's growing and not mine, or their, their, wife, you know, their wife says good things about them, doesn't pick and need me, and, and it does this. And, and can you see how comparison is this springboard for adultery, springboard for anger, springboard for lying and gossip, springboard for hate and murder, springboard for everything else because we think, I deserve this. Because if you're looking to others to get your identity, you will look for others to give you what you think you deserve. But when you look to Jesus for your identity and realize that everything is yes and amen, according to Ephesians 1, that I have every spiritual blessing according to Christ Jesus available to me. I don't need anything from you because Jesus has given me everything in his sacrifice. The Father has given me everything in his Son. And lastly, it's covetousness. We see that comparison was a habit and jealousy was an emotion. But covetousness turns to an action. We see this at verse 11, as we read, Saul took a spear and he threw it twice at David. It goes to verse 17, where he says, oh, I'll give, uh, uh, I'm going to promote David in the army. Outside, a oh, good thing, but in his heart he goes, so that hopefully the Philistines will kill him, so I don't have to coveted him, so he made a plan to destroy him. Verse 21, he gives him his daughter. Hopefully she'll be a snare to him and you'll fall and then God will have to punish him. Verse 25, the bribe price for his daughter was 100, we'll just say dead Philistines. Right? Because if he goes through that, clearly he's going to die if he tries to do that. And this jealousy led to actions of harm, actions to try and kill a place of hatred towards David. Elaine, if you want to jump back up on the keys. Worship team will invite you up in a second, but not yet. You see, the, the instruction to not covet, the command, it's like, oh, is comparison that bad? Well, it made the top ten. Last of the ten commandments, do not covet. Exodus goes on and says, don't covet your neighbor's wife, your neighbor's house, your neighbor's slave, your neighbor's employees, your neighbor's donkey. Stop, covering the, stop coveting that donkey. You see, do not covet is the hardest commandment to keep because it's the easiest one to be broken. Others cannot see when the commandment is broken because it's hidden in a person's heart where only God can see. And you can tell me, Daniel, I'm fine, and I won't be able to see the action. I, I can see if you stole. I can see if you murdered. I can hear if you disrespect. I can hear if you come. Whatever it is, I can see that you didn't take a Sabbath. But we can lie to ourselves. I don't covet. I'm fine. It's fine. Everything's good. I'm not an addict. I'm not anxious. I'm not, I'm not well, if, if you're coveting, you're probably anxious, but you hide it differently. I'm not any of these. I'm, I'm doing pretty good, Daniel. But to covet, when you covet what others have, 
you're telling God that we are not satisfied with him. And unlike the other commandments, which focus on outward actions, this commandment focuses on the condition of the heart. The other nine commandments are focused on, on doing a forbidden action, while this one focuses on the inward thoughts and the heart posture. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's, Exodus 20, 17. See, the Gospel of Luke describes Jesus' warning to guard one's heart against covetousness. To take care, it says, be on your guard against all covetousness. For one's life does not consist of the abundance of his possessions. Getting the approval, getting that job, of having that marriage, of having them like me or think that way about me. The habit of comparison, as subtle, as little, as sneaky as it is, will plant the seed of jealousy in your heart. And you'll wonder why you're struggling. You'll wonder why you have those negative thoughts. You'll wonder why you're not satisfied. You'll wonder why you see what's wrong in your marriage versus what's right in your marriage. You'll wonder why your kids frustrate you so much. You'll wonder, you'll wonder, you'll wonder. Because jealousy is growing. And if we don't ask help of the Holy Spirit to come, to weed it out, it will produce the fruit of covet. And all of a sudden we're acting on our feelings. We don't talk to those people anymore. We avoid them. We say, oh yeah, they're good, but yeah, yeah they're probably, they, got, they, they probably broke the law when they did that, or oh, they probably, they were just given that or this, and we start acting in all these crazy ways. Well, they have family to help them raise their kids. My kids would be, you know, they would be better raised if, if I had all that help, or, or oh, if I, if I just could work at home, and I, we got two jobs, we're working, and, and it couldn't, or if I just had that boat, I would catch more fish. I wouldn't. So what do we do? If, if the reality of the old life, of how we would find validation, would be the, the habit of comparison plants the seed of jealousy, and jealousy will produce the fruit of covetousness, the opposite is true in the new life that we live in Christ Jesus. Because the reality is, the practice of no longer comparing, but receiving who God has called you to, no longer looking for other people to tell me I am my identity, but to look at Jesus and receive who he is, who he's made me to be, and what he's called me to do. The practice of intentionally receiving, accepting my identity in Christ will produce the seed and the plant of gratitude. And I'm no longer jealous of saying, God, thank you for my wife that you trusted me with this family. God, thank you for this job that did this. Lord, thank you for the car that we drive that works most of the time. God, I thank you for my friends. I thank you. And we begin the practice and the natural habit of gratitude. And gratitude, if you continue to pour, if you continue to do it when you feel like it and when you don't feel like it. Gratitude is not happiness. Happiness is dependent on your circumstances. Gratitude is dependent on the goodness of a Father who has given you everything in Christ Jesus. And the same power that raised Christ from the dead lives in you to empower you, to change you, to bring hope in hopeless situations. And it's a decision to focus and to give praise where it's worthy and due. When we practice gratitude, it will give fruit to contentment. Well, you're okay. Well, you don't need something more to bring joy. There's nothing could be better than Jesus. I don't need to be the hand. He's made me the foot. And I'm so okay with being the foot. I don't deserve to be part of the body at all. But he saved me. And he redeemed me. And he's shaping me. God, I'm just so grateful. The practice of receiving plants the seed of gratitude, which when water, gratitude will produce the fruit of contentment. Friends, we see this in the life of Jesus. When he was baptized, he came out of the water and the Father said, this is my son in whom I love and whom I am well pleased that Jesus received his identity from the Father. 
and all the time. He said, oh, we do this, do this. Hey, I, I only do what I see the Father doing. He has given me this. I don't need to worry. I trust the Father. He says he was constantly praising and grateful for what God had given him, not trying to be something else. When people tried to come and say, hey, the disciples are doing this and yours aren't doing this. Or John said this. And he goes, oh, 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 I don't need to compare. I don't be, I'm just grateful for what God has called me to do. And when Jesus died and come back, he said, no one took my life from me. There was, I don't need to do what everyone else thinks I need to do to set up a social regime or a a physical army to throw off Rome, that I know what God has called me to, and I'm content with what the Father has asked me to do. And he was able to walk in strength. He was able to walk in clarity because his identity was in the Father, and spirit of gratitude, which allowed him to walk in contentment. And friends, that is available to you and me. Quickly, we're going to have five steps that we can take if this is something you struggle with. Uh, The prayer team, worship team. Worship team, you can come. And the prayer team over to the side here. Throughout this whole series, we're actually going to do something a little bit different. That's why we put offering a different spot in the service. We want to make an opportunity to respond. And we might be talking about some things that maybe aren't your thing or maybe not your sin to struggle with in which you become part of the prayer team. Say, God, would you set people free? Thank you. That's not, maybe not something I struggle with, but God, I'm going to engage. I'm going to learn. I'm going to lean in. And, and you probably struggle with more than you're wanting to admit. Let's be honest. But if you like, if you feel like you need to respond, and it might be a week, and it might not even be what they're talking about. It might have been something else. You want prayer for anything. We're going to have some of our elders over here in the corner. We have some communion that we'd love to just quickly take with you. The practice of saying, God, I'm I'm receiving all four cups of sanctification, of deliverance, of prayer. Lord, all of it. And then they're going to pray for you. And while that's going on, we're just going to go back into a song of worship all together. And at the end, we'll release. So it isn't time to check out. If you're good, start worshiping, thanking Jesus for what he's done. Start praying for people that they'd find freedom. But if you do struggle, there's five simple things. They'll be up on the screen. You can jot them down, check online after. I'll also be putting some book reading resources around this that are really helpful. Um, you can find that at horizonchurch.ca under weekly content. There's a blog that kind of summarizes what happens, but we'll make sure we put it in there. If, if this is really something you're like, I'm just done. I'm done struggling with this. I'm done comparing. I need to be set free. Number one, is to simply unmask the comparison in your own life. Own it. Stop making excuses. The Holy Spirit put his hand on something. Thank the Lord and respond. How do we unmask? We acknowledge. If we're not sure, say, God, search me. Show me where I'm doing this. Confess. Say, God, I repent. Sorry for comparing. I'm sorry for thinking that was going to find me joy. Lord, would you forgive me and repent? Simple steps. Say, God, would you help me? Forgive me for the sin of of comparison, of jealousy, of coveting. Lord, forgive me. Welcome him in. Number two, rather than looking around, focus on who God has created you to be. That's the first step in stopping comparing. Saying, God, who have you called me to be? I'm going to start taking steps towards that. And if you don't know who God's called you to, get in the Word. Because the word says a lot about who you are in Christ Jesus, in prayer and in devotions. The next Set Free retreat coming up in May. Join the Set Free. Get rid of some of those, those bondages, that baggage, the wrong thought patterns and habits. Hearing God the next time it is. If you need to hear what God says about you and you're struggling, stop putting up excuses. Stop saying, I'm more busy. Rearrange your schedule. Give six weeks. Say, God, I need to learn to hear the voice that spoke the creation into existence and speaks my identity into me. Serve. We had 32, 33 people sign up to be on team last week and say, hey, I don't want to just attend. God's called me to something. And I'm not sure if my purpose in life is to serve coffee, but I can serve coffee as I figure that out. We're going to journey together. Join a small group. That's why we have men's and women's nights. So we can get around other people and and rub shoulders. We got women, had one in the fourth, which is great. Men, we got four homes this Thursday, the 18th. We're going to be gathering together, praying and rubbing shoulders together. In community, we figure out who God's called us to be. Encounter nights, whatever it is, there's steps that we can take. Number three, detox from social media. 
If you struggle with it, I don't know if there's a way to stop without getting rid of your social media for a bit, at least. This normally comes up around New Year's. This year, God really convicted me. He says, how many times do you want to end up in January being sad that you're still addicted to your phone? Is it really that important? There'll be some, some links on what does it look like, steps or practices you can do to detox from your phone, which is a cesspool of comparison. Number four is practice gratitude. We already talked a little bit about this, but the Bible says to rejoice with those who are rejoicing, to mourn with those who are mourning. When you're comparing yourself to an enemy, don't, don't hate them, but pray for your enemies. There is an opposite spirit that we are called to engage in. We are not called to be jealous. We're called to be grateful. We're called to be gratitude. And if you struggle with gratitude, just start celebrating with that person that got that promotion. Start celebrating even when you don't feel like it. Don't worry. Your feelings will catch up with your decisions. And you start praising it. And you start thanking your wife for what she's doing rather than complain and you start thanking your husband for taking that trash out for for doing whatever it is you start just thanking God for the kids you start the opposite spirit of gratitude and thankfulness and watch the seed of jealousy and comparison begin to be weeded out of your life and lastly get prayer that may be your first step today pastor Daniel Man, I struggle with this. I just need someone to stand with me, agree with me, take communion, put a hand on my shoulder, and just believe with me for God that He would root the things out. I, God's gonna whatever God reveals, just say, God, forgive me. Lord, I confess that comparison on social media is my sin to that mom, to that dad, to that business, whatever it is, God, I, I that body type or, or that looks or whatever it is. Father, forgive me. That's my sin in comparison. Lord, would you forgive me? Help me see what you see.